one thing that sets Formula One apart from other forms of motorsport is that the Formula One teams are given the rule book before every season and told to build their cars in line with those rules. There's no set shape or anything, it's that here's the rule book, design the car. Unlike other forms of motorsport, it means that each Formula One car is unique to each team, although there will be some similarities based on what has worked for other teams. In other forms of racing, the rules are often incredibly tightly controlled, or they just run a spec series. IndyCar, for example. The cars are all the same, save for the engines, although IndyCar does allow some minor modifications to some of the parts. Except the rear crash structure, obviously. You, you, don't, you don't go touching that. In V8 supercars, on the other hand, they have a lot of control parts for cost-cutting reasons, and the cars are on a control chassis with control shocks and control brakes. And... Well, everything else that's on the list of stuff that they have to use. GT3, they're regulated by balance of performance, and that stops one manufacturer making a rocket ship that then makes things too expensive so all the other manufacturers pull out. F1, on the other hand, so long as it's within the dimensions and numbers set out by the FIA, it's legal. Which is why there is usually somebody within a team whose job it is to look at the rulebook and find any instance where the rules aren't exactly 100% clear. Jonathan Wheatley, who was at Red Bull until last year, was known as being somebody who had an obsession with the rulebook, being able to find any loophole or grey area that could then be exploited. And that team also had Adrian Newey, who could also find loopholes and grey areas to come up with the next bit of aerodynamics and physics bending and make an unbeatable car. So what things have appeared on Formula 1 cars that are the result of the engineers saying, it doesn't say here that I can't? Well, most of them are actually covered at some point on the channel. The retractable skirt seen on the Lotus Ground Effect cars, Brabham's ride control suspension, the Brabham fan car where the team was able to prove to the FIA that the fan was for cooling the engine more than it was for sucking the whole thing to the ground, and more recently the blown and double diffusers. And I've had the opportunity to get a good look at one of those recently, and I still have no idea as to how that thing worked, yet I had one right in front of my face for at least 20 minutes. And everybody thinks I'm clever. But at the start of the hybrid era came the next in a long line of show me in the rulebook where it says I'm not allowed to do this, and that was Frick, front and rear interconnected suspension. Trying to do fancy trickery with the suspension isn't exactly a new thing. As mentioned, Brabham had a hydraulically activated suspension system back in the 1980s that was designed to skirt, no pun intended, the FIA's ban on... the skirts. In 1981, the FIA banned the retractable skirts and mandated fixed skirts that were designed to seal off the ground effect tunnels and improve the downforce. The FIA also forced a ride height of 60mm or 2.4 inches that reduced the available downforce available. So the teams had to come up with their own ways of getting around these rules. Most teams reattached the front and rear wings to the cars instead of having the whole car be the wing and that regained the lost downforce, but at the expense of drag. But Gordon Murray, who was the chief designer at Brabham at the time, designed something called a hydro-pneumatic suspension that was able to trick the FIA. When the car was sat still and getting all the checks done, the car passed all the ride height checks easily. But when the car was out on track, the car was running much lower than everybody else's and was able to produce more downforce. The Brabham team was then able to take off any excess drag and have a car that was fast everywhere and not just in the corners. In 1995, Tyrrell tried something called Hydrolink suspension, but because Tyrrell didn't exactly have the budget of Williams, McLaren, Ferrari and those top teams, it was a good idea on paper, but the initial prototype didn't work properly, and because they couldn't spend their way out of the problem, the project was an abject failure. So everything went quiet on the trick suspension front for a long time. The next time we had anything that could be considered trick suspension was the mass dampers that appeared on the Renault R25 late on into the 2005 season, and was then banned sort of midway through the 2006 season. The mass dampers were a clever system that allowed the two Renaults of Fernando Alonso and Giancarlo Fisichella to have a much better ride over bumps and curbs, and it was then banned by the FIA because the FIA considered it to be a movable aerodynamic device. Although having looked into it in its own dedicated video, I don't see how that's the case. But then again, I'm not an engineer. Although, there were a couple of so-called Ferrari International Assistance moments in 2006, so... I don't know, maybe it's tinfoil hat time. But then, the hybrid era began, with the teams having to adapt to a brand new high-tech era of Formula 1. 1 1.6 litre hybrid engines, less downforce, and everything else that came with it. But out the other side came Mercedes, who were utterly destroying the competition only losing the Canadian Grand Prix because the two cars started suffering with brake issues and that allowed Daniel Ricciardo to take his first win. 
But underneath all that silver bodywork and under the bodywork of several other cars as it so happens, was a system that was being utilised to make things a bit easier for the cars to handle. Like mentioned, this was the front and rear interconnected system, or just simply Frick, and it was actually a German publication that came up with the name rather than it being an official name given by the teams or even the FIA. And while cable-based systems had existed in the 1970s and Ferrari had tried it during the 1970s as well as some Soviet racing cars, these new hydraulically operated systems were a lot more advanced than what had come before. The reason the teams were all, well at least most of them, were using Frick is because it had the same benefits as Brabham's hydro pneumatic suspension from the early 80s. Frick was all about ride height control without having to go into the complicated and highly illegal since the end of 1993 realms of the Williams style active suspension systems. With the advancements of the diffusers since the turn of the 21st century, and now Formula 1 cars were starting to rely more and more and more on underside aero as well as the topside aero, the ride heights needed to be in a certain range to make the diffusers work to the optimal level. It's around this time that we really started to see the teams using more extreme rake angles, with Red Bull going for their now famous face down booty up arrangement to get the diffusers working at their absolute best. The thing is, when an F1 car brakes, the car is going to have all its weight on the front axle, and the front ride height is going to decrease, while the rear end ride height is going to want to go up, and that can affect the diffuser's performance. The front end downforce goes up, the rear end downforce goes down, and the car is unstable under braking. Think of it as like doing a stoppy on Grand Theft Auto. It's pretty much the same thing. Now, here comes the difficult part explaining how all this works in a very low budget way because a my animation skills are non-existent and b what the f is after effects but we'll work something out so what we've got here is a williams car from 2015 so it's a sort of similar age to the cars we're dealing with it's just that ironically in 2015 the cars wouldn't have frick but we'll get to all the banning stuff later on. As mentioned, when the car is using a traditional suspension system, and by that the front and rear suspension assemblies work independently of each other, as they had done in the 90s and into the early 2000s, we get that hitting the front brakes on your push bike as an 11 year old effect. The front end compresses and the rear end goes up. And the teams don't want that, because they will A, need to raise the front ride height to stop the skid block scraping on the floor, which then knackers the aero performance, and B, the drivers will have an unstable car under braking. So they either stiffen the suspension, which then affects the handling over the rest of the track, or they leave it, and the driver still complains. So the thinking was, in the development of these systems, if we get the front end to drop under braking but somehow manage to mitigate the amount that it drops, how can we make the rear end react so that everything remains balanced? How can we connect the two without using a computer and get the desired effect? That's the theory, anyway. So what the teams essentially did, and I'm trying to make this as simple as possible with the options available to chase down more detailed articles later on if you wish, is that the teams hooked up hydraulic systems that had the front and rear interconnected, hence the name. The goal of the teams was to have the ride height as stable as possible under braking and while in a straight line, where the car is being pushed down to the ground at its maximum level, so that the car is as balanced as it could possibly be. As the car brakes with a non-connected system, the front heave damper would compress, and the rear would extend. With Frick, when the car brakes, the front heave damper pushes hydraulic fluid out of a cylinder under that braking load and sends it through a pipe to the rear, where the rear doesn't extend as far, maintaining the aero performance under braking. When the car accelerates again, a second set of piping does the opposite effect, and the rear doesn't squat as far and take front load off the tyres, which might still need to do some turning in some corners, and you get more balanced tyre wear. You could even fit a third lot of piping so that the car doesn't have its rake angle in a straight line and it becomes flat and in turn reduces the drag. So it's a lot like the active suspension systems that Williams had in the early 90s, but without any of the computers. But you still get the same effect. I can try and help you visualise all of that. With the car having a higher rear ride height, or more rake, however you want to describe it, the rear wing is pointing up into the air, which means through the magic of physics you have more drag as a result. Teams who could extract more from the diffuser could then run less rear wing for less drag and offset it a bit, but if you can somehow get the rear wing lower to the ground, you get the gains in a straight line without compromising the cornering downforce because you've not had to take anything off. The Williams Active Suspension System could do a similar thing, which meant more top speed for the car without having to worry about taking that excess drag off. And with the car running as low as possible overall, everything adds up for more performance. 
Like mentioned, it's a very basic way of explaining things, but it was also possible to hook everything up so that it could control the roll in the corners as well, which is just absolutely mesmerising. But the cars would also be better over curbs at the same time, as they worked not unlike a mass damper, in a way. Mercedes, at the time that Frick started to come under the microscope, had been using some sort of interconnected system for about three years, and Mercedes had by far the most advanced system, because they were controlling everything that the car could do, suspension-wise that being pitch and roll. But while Mercedes was at the forefront because their system was a lot more advanced than everybody else's, think Braun and the double diffuser, pretty much the rest of the grid was using one as well. It's rumoured that only Force India didn't have a system at some point during 2014. Just after the British Grand Prix of 2014, the FIA announced that anybody running this Frick system might be reported to the stewards and quotes and vox pops from other team principals started hitting the internet as they all had something to say about it. Eric Boulier, who was then at McLaren, believed that it was the over-engineering of these systems as teams tried to catch up to Mercedes that was leading to these letters being sent out by the FIA. Some of the teams might have said that cutting costs was the reason for any desire to see them reined in or outright banned, but most people would say it was because Mercedes were too good and getting rid of it might slow them down a bit. Mercedes, Red Bull and Lotus were thought to have Frick systems that control pitch and roll. Everybody else had a less advanced one. Marussia had only just got their Frick system, so it would have been in Caterham's best interest to see it banned to try and prevent Marussia getting an advantage. Marussia had managed to score points at the Monaco Grand Prix, so Caterham would have had to have done something to try and rein them in. But it has to be said that this system might have got the teams all working together for the first time in Formula 1 history. Charlie Whiting sent letters to every single one of the teams issuing this technical directive about the Frick systems, saying that they knew the teams had one and it might be contravening Article 3.15 of the technical regulations, the regulations that concern movable aerodynamic devices that aren't the FIA's own regulated DRS systems. How the FIA came to know about Frick, I'm not sure. Did one of the teams dob Mercedes in, or did the FIA know a system existed but were now at a point where they're going, OK, you're taking the piss now? The reason it was just a technical directive and not banned immediately is because the FIA said to the teams, we'll all meet up and have a vote on banning it for 2015, so you can keep using it until the end of 2014, or we can ban it now. Your choice. They were waiting on the teams to respond before doing anything, really. If the teams didn't vote to keep them for the rest of the season and then outlaw them for 2015, it would be banned for the German Grand Prix onwards instead. But the vote had to be unanimous. If all the teams said yes to keeping it for 2014 and then banning it for 2015, then that's what would happen. They'd keep it all through 2014 and then it'd be banned for the start of next season. But if all the teams voted yes and that one team that didn't have it, rumoured to be Force India, said no, it would be banned for the German Grand Prix onwards. It was quite a delicate situation, for want of a better phrase. But the situation was made more confusing because the letters that Whiting sent out meant that any team caught using Frick at the German Grand Prix could potentially be excluded, and Charlie was very, very clear on this point. So it could have ended with what might have happened at Montreal in 1993 if the FIA had gone through with the immediate ban on driver aids. Everybody would have been disqualified except for the two Dallaras, or Lolas, whichever chassis they were running that year, the, the BMS cars. But the system wasn't outright banned. It was just hinted at being illegal, but it was effectively banned because the teams could be disqualified if they were caught using it. So all the teams who had Frick voluntarily removed it. Whether this decision to do so was done in a secret team meeting at the Silverstone test where those letters were sent out or later on is unknown, but all the teams unanimously agreed to take it off to avoid any potential disqualifications. With the removal of Frick done, there was hope that finally the gap from Mercedes to the rest of the grid would be reduced, but other teams were a bit more cautious. It's a bit like the flexi wing band coming in for this weekend at the Spanish Grand Prix. People are getting very cautious about how it's going to affect McLaren. The general consensus is, it might not affect them at all. Eric Boulier told Sky Sports at the time, It came as a surprise. It's not based on any team action, it's an FIA action, and we have been warned at the weekend that something could come out of this. We've got this letter from Charlie Whiting. It's actually a technical directive. Most of the teams, if not all the teams on the grid, they are using this kind of suspension system, which is connecting a little bit different to use the best of the vehicle's dynamics. I think some teams may have been extreme. This is maybe why the FIA is questioning the legality of this system. And in the case of McLaren, we are quite relaxed, to be honest. We don't see any issue with that for us. 
I don't think there would be too many disturbances for the rest of the season. We don't like it when there's a technical or sporting change during the course of the season, but maybe there is some reason behind why the FIA wants to do it. Meanwhile, over at Red Bull, Christian Horner said that they would go along with whatever the FIA asked them to do, and they weren't too up in arms over the ban either. Mercedes, meanwhile, made no comment. So did this ban work in reducing Mercedes' advantage? Well, evidently not. Rosberg was on pole for the German Grand Prix with a time two tenths faster than Valtteri Bottas in the Williams, who was in second. Massa was third in the second Williams, with Magnussen in fourth, so it was an all Mercedes powered top four. Hamilton, meanwhile, in the other Mercedes, started dead last after crashing out in the second qualifying session and took a new gearbox for his trouble. But even with starting last, he recovered to third, finishing just under two seconds behind Bottas, who was about 21 seconds behind Rosberg come the end. This is despite Hamilton knocking off part of his front wing end plate after contact with Button, where Jensen was taking a wider line through the hairpin to maximise his exit, while Hamilton thought that Jensen wasn't trying to fight him. Lewis had to go onto a three stopper as a result, but still came home 22 seconds ahead of Vettel's Red Bull. But did it affect Mercedes in the long run? Well, they had to redesign the 2015 car, which was completely designed around Frick, but it didn't really matter that much because they dominated the next season as well, and dominated even harder into 2016 before the wide boy regulations came into effect. And then they dominated those as well, so... not really. So if Frick banned, the next big idea had to come at some point. In 2017, Mercedes brought a new trick suspension system that was banned after complaints from other teams. And more recently, Red Bull had this really clever anti-dive system that they were using that helped them to dominate through 2023. But this is the thing with Formula One, ban something and they'll just come up with something else to replace it. But Frick was definitely very clever. It was active suspension, but without the active suspension. It was totally legal, but maybe the advancement of it got too much. But that's one for you to discuss in the comments. Did it constitute active aero, or was it just lumped in there like the mass dampers? Because it could. So then, a look at the Frick suspension systems that the teams were using during the 2014 F1 season that then led to their outright ban a little after the German Grand Prix, even though they were sort of banned for the German Grand Prix, but not officially banned for the German Grand Prix. But either way, if this has been an interesting video for you, then do give it one of those like things so I know I did a good job. And for more videos like this from the Motorsport History Books, get subscribed and also get the bell on so you never miss out on anything else to do around here. Massive thanks as ever go out to the mad lads over at Patreon who continue to support me at a more personal level. And if you want to help with the picture purchasing piggy bank or otherwise keep the lights on around here, there's a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, affiliates and other bits and bobs you might want or need to know. Well, there's super thanks if you just want to do a one and done donation and memberships for Patreon without the Patreon. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. Mm -hmm.